the junior president of the West Hawaiian Land Board of Trustees. Notice of the meeting has been posted online for at least 72 hours. A recording of the meeting is being made and will be available to the public at a later date. Time now, 5.55, and I call this meeting to order. I'll now begin the roll call. Calling board member by name, signify your presence by stating present or here. here. Mr. Isio, Mr. Isio, Mr. Mr. Jackie, Jackie present. Okay, Mr. Present. Mr. Okay, Mr. 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 Present. Mr. Hyman, Mr. Here. 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 To Mark Mr. Here. 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 And Mr. 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 Let the record, the record, the record show that show a that member, member, member of the member or in attendance. Well, well, before we before get to the open prayer, 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 actually, I think we'll have to listen to the feedback there with us before we get to the start. Absolutely, Coach. So first, so first off, I'd like, I'd like to, to um, acknowledge, acknowledge and, and thank, thank the Board, the board of, trustees of Trustees for, for uh, having, the having the confidence in me to, to sit in, sit in this, this seat, this chair. This chair. I'm, so I'm so proud, proud and so happy, and so happy uh, to, to serve, serve the boys and girls, and girls the, parents, the parents, faculty, faculty staff, 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 administration of, of my, my beloved Boswati. I am, I am sitting, sitting in my third grade classroom. I attended the Boston School of 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 Boston School
played such an important role in my life and I want to thank them. I've thanked them personally many times and I thanked Mrs. Peterson many, many times. And I know right now she's looking down from heaven and with a big smile on her face saying, I knew you'd be there one day. And, um, and so I've thanked them publicly now. And again, board of trustees, thank you so much for your confidence in me. And you know, like the New England Patriots, their mantra is do your job. I will definitely do my job to the best of my ability. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Valdez, and on behalf of the <laughs> on behalf of the board of trustees, we, we welcome you to back home. Thank you. Item three, opening prayer, Dr. Valdez. The invocation this evening will be delivered by Belen Torres. She is our Wesico East High School curriculum instructional facilitator. She's on virtually. Okay. All right, Ms. Torres, you may proceed. She can't hear. She can't hear. She can't hear. Try it again. You want to give her the cue again? Okay. The invocation will be delivered by Belen Torres. She is our Westlaco East High School curriculum instructional facilitator. Ms. Torres, you may proceed. Good evening, everyone. Yes, I was not able to hear you all for a minute there, but thank you for the opportunity. Let us begin. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to thank you for the opportunities that you've given us this day. Thank you for the life that you've given us. Thank you for being with us today and protecting us through these last 18 months as we have faced many challenges. Your mighty hand has been with us. We ask you tonight that as we gather together, you protect all those families of our community that may still be battling COVID or any circumstance this evening. We ask that you be with our teachers and staff that may also still be battling COVID or battling family issues, whatever it may be, Father. We ask that you protect them, that you keep them in the palm of your hand. We also ask this evening that your favor, that your protection and your strength be with our school board, our school principals and their leadership teams and our district leadership team as we embark on a new school year and as we welcome students, staff, and teachers back to our campuses, that your joy, your strength, your wisdom be with all of us as we go through the 2021-2022 school year. We thank you for everything this evening and we thank you for this meeting that is about to proceed. In Jesus' name we pray and we all say amen. 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 Thank you, Belen. Let the record reflect that uh, Coach Jesse Trevino is joining the meeting virtually. Item four, Pledge of Allegiance, Texas Pledge. I'm doing this. Reciting the Pledge of Allegiance and Texas Pledge this evening, we have Riley Caballero. Riley is a senior at Wesco East High School and is the son of Abel and Lucy Caballero. He is the head drum major of the Wildcat Regiment and plays the clarinet. He is a part of the National Honor Society and the UIL math team. Priscilla Caballero is also a senior at Wesco East and is the daughter of Oscar and Alma Caballero. She is the assistant drum major for the Wildcat Regiment and plays the alto saxophone. Priscilla is a state solo and an ensemble qualifier and has been in the honors band for three years. Thank, Thank you, you Riley. Riley. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. And Priscilla. And Priscilla. 
Item five, awards and recognitions, Dr. Valdez. All right, we have awards and recognitions this evening. Mr. Carlos Robedo, you may proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Board President, members of the board. Dr. Valdez, we would like to recognize our AP scholars over the past year. Tonight we honor several high school students who recently received academic recognition from the College Board Advanced Placement Program for their exceptional achievement on the AP exams. Our students enrolled in college level courses while still in high school to earn college credit, advanced placement, or both. A small percentage of the millions of students worldwide who took the AP exams performed at a sufficiently high level to earn an AP Scholar Award. We'll start off with West Laco East High School. AP scholars completed three or more AP exams with scores of three or higher in the subjects that include biology, chemistry, world history, and English literature. From West Laco East High School, the AP scholars are Victoria Cruz, Alexa Luan, Roxana Morales Sebrovia, Rene Tamez. Next slide, please, as we take a look at our AP scholars from West Laco High School. We have Joaquin Barón, Antonia Borjas, Miguel Cepeda, Marina Garcia, Romy Garza, David Gutierrez, Eileen Irison, Clarissa Hasso, Sasha Mendoza, Matthew Moore, Brian Peña, Yamileth Rivera, next slide please, Ashley Rodriguez, Luis Salazar, Henry Sander, Emily Van Tilburg. Students who earned an AP Scholar with honor averaged a score of at least 3.25 on the AP exam taken and scored a three or higher on four or more exams. These students who are AP Scholar Award winners, Caleb King and Aaron Puente. We'd also like to recognize several students also earned AP Scholar with distinction. They had an average score of at least 3.5 on all AP exams taken and scored three or higher on five or more exams. Students are Joseph Cardona and Mia Cavazos. Thank you. That concludes our awards and recognition. Thank you, Carlos. And congratulations to all our students for their outstanding achievements. Item six, proclamations. Dr. Valdez. We have proclamation for National Security Officer Week, which is September 13th through the 17th, 2021. Mr. Robledo, you may proceed. I'd like to welcome to the room some of our security officers and a couple of our canines also who take care of our schools. Let's welcome into the room some of our security officers. How about a big hand for them? Whereas National Security Officer Appreciation Week will be celebrated at the West Laco Independent School District during the week of September 13th through September 17th. And whereas security officers are hardworking, highly trained individuals who are often our country's first responders. And whereas these individuals deter crime, lead evacuations, work closely with local law enforcement, and are constantly vigilant in their efforts to keep us safe. Therefore, be it resolved that Armando Cuer, WISD Board President, does hereby support and proclaim September 13th through the 17th, 2021, as National Security Officers Appreciation Week. How to big hand for officers. Thank you, and uh, we appreciate the hard work and, and the service that you provide for our school district. So thanks again. Uh, anything for you, Dr. Lundin? No, just thank you so much for all that you do. Um, you know, you have a, a challenging uh, job each day, so we thank you for, for making sure to keep our, our um, schools and district facilities safe. Thank you. Item seven, public comments. We have none? We have none. Thank you, Carlos. 
Item 8, superintendent's report. Mr. Dr. President, Redis. yes, we do have a superintendent's report this evening. Uh, we do have three bulleted items. Uh, one is on COVID-19 and school readiness, of course, that is in the forefront of our priority, a list of priorities in the district. Um, as you know, cases have, are increasing as far as positive cases in Hidalgo County. Um, just today, I think they, we, the county reported 835 new cases and five coronavirus related deaths. So it's unfortunate that the numbers are increasing. So as a district, obviously, we have to be extremely proactive in ensuring that everyone is safe. Boys and girls, faculty, staff, administration, in every single facility um, in, our prop, in our district property. So um, that is number one on my agenda and number one for our cabinet team. So um, we are going to be very extremely vigilant in, uh, to try to guarantee as much as possible. Of course, we can't guarantee 100%, right? I mean, um, it's, it's such a, we're in unprecedented, Ten times and then to make sure that everyone is safe it's gonna take all of us working together as a team I you know I don't know if you've heard of the three W's and forcing the three W's wear a mask wash your hands and watch your distance so it's very simple where Wesleyco we implement the three W's right and of course the mask is optional but we still have to be extremely cautious. And so I strongly encourage the three W's from everyone on the team. Wear a mask, wash your hands, and watch your distance. Um, so I want the board, the parents, the community, the children to know that we're going to do whatever we have to do to guarantee and make sure that everyone is as safe as possible and that parents in the community can feel um, at ease to send their children to school. Uh, we will be conducting campus walks to do audits as far as to make sure that our facilities are ready to go. The children report in two weeks, so it's fast and furious to make sure that we're ready, and that is number one right now. So I'm gonna turn it over to the team. Uh, presenting on COVID-19 and school readiness, we have our risk uh, management team and Ms. Kaufman um, to present. So, Mr. De La Rosa, you may proceed. Thank you, Dr. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Dr. Valdez and uh, Coach Cuellar, members of the board. Good evening. So, a couple weeks ago, we put out uh, this little two-page flyer that was pushed out through social media through um, our internet site, and it's basically like a quick two-page guidance to parents and students of what to expect uh, to, when to come back next year. So, again, please note that these are preliminary. Uh, guidelines and process uh, we're getting new information almost on a daily basis so when we did put this out a couple weeks ago there have been some things that have come down and changed uh, since then and I'll get into those later on in the in the presentation but as uh, Dr. Valdez mentioned again masks are we highly recommend them uh, they are strongly encouraged so when um, uh, when in, members of the public look at this online uh, there's a little uh, you can hover over the little uh, Governor Abbott, Abbott's executive order. So when they do that, it'll take them to the website uh, where the executive order is posted. Uh, again, screening and temperature checks. So we highly encourage everyone to pre-screen for COVID. Uh, one of the things that we've seen and one of the best uh, things that we tell parents and we tell staff is that if you're feeling ill, please stay home. Do not come to work. Do not come to school. Contact your campus, your administrator, uh, parents, please contact the campus and or the nurse. And I'll go ahead and get into the protocols once we get into that part of it. Um, when we wrote this guidance, um, the direction was, okay, as far as temperature screening goes, that we will continue to do those for uh, elementary students. We've, we've received guidance from TEA. We received guidance from the CDC that, you know, temperature checks of asymptomatic individuals, you know, are, is not recommended. So. We're still looking at that, um, especially at the high school levels. It would be extremely difficult to, you know, screen, you know, 2,500 students. Some of them ride the bus. Some of them get dropped off. Some of them walk. Some of them drive their own car. So, again, that is still a work in, a work in progress on that, and we will provide additional updated guidance on that. 
again, the quarantine uh, procedures, and we ask that anyone who is unvac unvaccinated, or anyone who is unvaccinated and is uh, in known close contact uh, with a positive case of COVID-19, they need to stay home in quarantine uh, for five to 10 days. And I will get a little bit uh, deeper into that later on the, in the presentation. And of course, vaccinated employees uh, do not have to quarantine if they're in known close contact. Uh, we're still going to continue our cleaning processes. I remember that you know last year you all were made aware of the you know the the, the WISD you know uh, custodial team you know we're in this together. So again, we're going to follow all the CDC recommendations on cleaning uh, for schools, and of course the members of the public can ho hover over that little link and it'll take them to the CD web CDC website. Again, you know sick individuals, we ask that you please, if you are experiencing symptoms, if you're not feeling well, to please you know stay home contact your campus uh, administrator and your school nurse. And of course, they will walk you through, you know, what needs to be done after that and how to get back to school. Uh, COVID-19 screening and wrapping testing. Uh, again, that we were providing the screening testing services uh, for employees and students during the district. And uh, Ms. Kaufman can chime in on this. As of right now, we're still going to use the leftover Abbott binary tests uh, that were left over from the previous school year. We're still waiting on guidance uh, from TEA as far as which type of test they are going to send us uh, for, the, um, for the start of the new school year. But there are other resources for testing, of course. So we have the curative van at the high school. We have a list of doctors that you can go get um, uh, testing done at. And I know there's a local physician here that's going to, to address the board. I'm not going to steal any of his thunder. But again, classrooms, again, frequent cleaning will take place. Uh, the cafeteria. All students will go back to eating breakfast in the classrooms that were doing that before. Uh, but again, the, the students will go back into the cafeterias to eat their meals. Uh, where possible, again, we will you know, uh, assign, uh, assign seating where it's possible. Again, if we have 800 you know, students in, a, in, a, in an elementary school, it's going to be extremely hard to you know, maintain that three feet of social distances. But we have been working with the principals. So we're going to do the very, very best we can to make sure that everybody is, you know, is adequately social distanced. Again, for the buses, uh, there are no restrictions on the buses. So if we have a full load of 72 students, uh, we are going to have to pick them up. We are not going to you know, leave anybody behind. But again, uh, thanks to the you know, thank you board for last meeting, we did went ahead and approved that the, um, the um, UV purifier systems for the buses and those should be starting to be installed probably within the next week or two. Again, COVID-19 vaccines, uh, we can't stress enough the importance of, of obtaining a vaccine. And when members of the public that see this document online or through social media, if you hover over the little uh, Our Vaccine Clinic opportunities, you hover over that and it'll take you to our website where it'll take you to either RGV, it'll give you the RGV Max Vax option, uh, HEB is also providing vaccines, CVS, Walmart. So vaccines are very readily available. They're easy, they're easily available. It's not that when we first started, you know, that there was quite, you know, a rush to get vaccinated and there was more uh, demand than supply. Now it's the opposite. There's more supply than demand. So uh, we're pushing that very, very hard. Mr. Odobledo and his team, you know, are getting the, the message out on social media and uh, are through KWES you know, to make sure that everybody has the opportunity uh, to get vaccinated. There are certain, there are clinics that are coming up at different campuses throughout the year. And again, that's all on social media. Uh, and now okay, what's that they're pushing out. So what we're doing this year uh, for the new school year, since you know we're all coming back 100%, is that we did um, put together COVID-19 school readiness teams, response teams. So these are gonna be uh, the campus administrator, the principal, the head nurse, um, administrators, nurses, uh, nursing assistants, any team that the, the campus principal decides to put together to make sure they're able to answer questions, they're able to perform the contact tracing. They're able to send notifications. And basically, all things COVID within the campus. Mrs. Kaufman and I are going to start training these individuals now that everybody's back. We had a meeting with the principals uh, on Friday before we left. And um, so all things COVID to make sure everybody's you know, um, putting out the same message and everybody knows what to do. So if the principal is gone and if somebody does test positive with COVID, then there's backups for her to make sure, or he or her, to make sure that everything gets uh, taken care of appropriately. Next slide, please. So again, these are our protocols that we have. So when an employee or student um, reports that they are positive for COVID-19, the campus COVID response team uh, will work with other staff to determine who may have been in known close contact. 
So again, uh, any staff members that, that test positive, there's a Google form that uh, the campus COVID team fills out, sends the information uh, to the risk management department, and we take over the, the case management from there. As far as the students go, there's a different Google form that the uh, nurses will input that information, and then the nurses will reach out to the parents and let them know uh, what's going on, what they need to do. Uh, and also, we have an obligation to report everything to the Hidalgo County uh, Health Department and to uh, TEA, Department of Health State Services. So we report every positive uh, case that we have, we report those to two different agencies. So Ms. Kaufman reports them to the, to the county, I report them to TEA. So since we came back, or right now currently, just for some information, we have 40 employees that have tested positive so far for COVID. 13 of those have actually been on campus. So a lot of the employees um, came back over the break uh, they reported to us that you know they, they were in fact positive with COVID. So they're sitting out as we speak, uh, but 13 of those have actually already been on campus and that's reflected in the, in the dashboard that's put out on the internet. I think Mr. Uh, Martinez updates that every other day. So revised isolation or known close contact. I know there's been a lot of uh, talk uh, you know, in the public about, well, you know, do they have to quarantine? Do they not have to quarantine? So uh, if an employee or student is fully vaccinated, again, they do not need to quarantine or be restricted from work in any way if they have no symptoms. So we do recommend that these individuals who are in known close contact, that they are in fact fully vaccinated, we recommend that they get them, that they test three to five days after the exposure, okay? And we also recommend, of course, that they monitor their symptoms, and we also ask them to wear a well-fitting mask for the next 14 days, um, just as a, as a precaution. Um, if an employer or student is not, is not vaccinated um, and they do not have any symptoms, they may return uh, to work and or school on day 10 after exposure without testing and as long as they're symptom-free. So again, the risk management uh, department man, uh, handles the employee case management where the nurses handle the student case management. You can return on day five uh, with a negative PCR test uh, as early as day five or on day seven. So some, some places like Curative do, um, do provide the testing, but they take you know, anywhere from at the max two days. Sometimes you receive results in the day. So if you test on day five and you get a negative result on day seven, you can come back. But there are uh, facilities that offer a rapid PCR test in 15, 20 minutes. Again, we'll take those after day five. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so again, some of the exceptions and some of the new things at TA, and this is some of the confusion that, that's, that I've heard out there in the community. So in the classroom setting, um, the known close, known close contact definitions exclude students uh, who, who all of them are wearing a, uh, or a face mask at the time. So what that means, if the infected student and the students that are around them are both wearing uh, face masks, then only these known that only the positive student needs to quarantine. The other two do not, uh, or the or the students around them do not. If everybody's wearing a mask, so that's why again we stress the importance of wearing a mask. You know, we can tell parents that hey, if you if your child is wearing a mask, if by any chance they're in known close contact with somebody who is, they do not they do not need to quarantine. They can come back to school. Okay, of course, and continue to monitor their symptoms. So TA also stated that, you know, there's no need to, um, to do contact tracing anymore. Uh, we've made a decision at the administrative level to go ahead and continue to do contact tracing regardless of what uh, uh, the guidelines that TA uh, has stated. And it just doesn't seem, it, you know, for me, for example, I would want to know if I was a known contact with somebody, especially somebody who's not vaccinated. So we will continue to do the, the contact tracing um, for students and staff. The difference is, is that in the past, uh, if a student was a known, known close contact, then the entire classroom was notified and the entire class had to go home and quarantine. Um, this is different. They did, the, the guidelines did change that we only have to identify the people who were within three feet, three to six feet for more than 15 minutes. So again, the nurse will work with uh, the teacher and the, uh, the students to identify those students that you know, were really around them, maybe were in the same pod or sat together in the cafeteria or sat together during lunch or went out to lunch if they're uh, high school students. So that's the thing that's gonna change. We're no longer sending the entire class home and the only people that, we, that will be notified are the parents of the 
students who were identified as known close contact. So the, the days of you know, the entire you know, campus getting the message, okay, well, there was somebody in the school that, that, that uh, tested positive, TA said no more to that. So again, we're going above and beyond what TA is recommending. You know, we're still, we feel we still have an obligation to parents and students and even employees to, to work and identify them who are known close contact. Um, so again, another one of the, the, I guess the hot topics are the leave options uh, that are available to employees who are positive or who are known close contact. So um, the FFRCA, the Family First Coronavirus Act, basically it was an unfunded mandate that stated that uh, we have to grant 10 days of emergency paid sick leave uh, to employees who were either positive or known close contact. And then there was the expanded family medical leave that applied to employees whose uh, campus or school was shut down due to COVID. Um, that ended on December 31st. Uh, the board uh, did take action and passed a resolution extending that, and that was extended to the end of the uh, of, of last school year. So when that school year ended, then the uh, the resolution ended. So if that's something that I did uh, visit with Dr. Valdez this morning, if that's something that the board would want to consider, then you know, visit with Coach Correa during coach plan during board planning and. Uh, we can prepare an amended resolution. Of course, these are all local funds, so I know that Mr. Sanchez will probably want to chime in on that to make sure that that's something that we can actually afford. So as far as the expanded family medical leave at, uh, that's really moot at this point because schools are open. There shouldn't be anything that's uh, shut down. So again, aside from all of that, um, we do have ample supplies of PPE, uh, desk shields, masks, hand sanitizers, hand washing stations. Uh, there are water filling stations being installed. Uh, the, uh, the board just approved that a couple meetings ago, again, along with the touchless water faucets. We have the HEPA air purifiers in all the classrooms. Um, we have the uh, UV uh, systems in the bus. So bottom line is, is we're ready. I feel very confident. You know, my kids are, can't wait to get back to school. Um, of course, this is this. Everything that I've talked about has all been an effort. That's you know everybody's participating in. It, you know my department, health services, warehouse, maintenance, HVAC. It's a it's a group of a lot of people working together to uh, to put this together. So I feel very confident that 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 uh, we're ready to go. So and with that, I'll answer any questions y'all might have. I wrote a couple of notes down as you were speaking. I'm just going to confirm with you as I, I wrote down the things that you were saying because I have been getting a lot of concerns from employees and parents. You said if a person who's vaccinated mm -hmm. has been exposed, they can come back. They don't have to quarantine. Correct. Correct. So are we not all asking for, even though it hasn't been three to five days, just bring me back a negative test when you come back? Because I know I've, I've heard other districts, for example, today was our first day back and I already had a couple of friends who said, hey, they, there were some teachers, they were asymptomatic. They were showing, they had no fever, they had no symptoms. They tested positive. We sent a couple of people home. They had no idea they were positive because they've been vaccinated and they're not showing symptoms. Can we do, or I don't know what you guys think, I, has, the, and has it been talked about weekly screenings for everybody? Because you might be carrying something and we don't even know it. That's, and uh, I, I can defer that to Ms. Kaufman, but to my, to my knowledge and my understanding that, that we can provide the screening, uh, we can offer it, but we can't mandate it. Okay. Green. That's part of the TDA rules, is that we can't mandate it. I know that some districts are mandating and I don't know how they're getting around that, but um, remember that the screenings that we're doing are simply screenings. It's not a diagnostic test. So if you would test positive, you would still have to go get a PCR. Right. But that's what I think that TDEM is hoping to change for the fall. I'm hoping they're going to give us a, P a rapid PCR test, but I don't know. And, that, and that's the thing that I mentioned. We're still waiting to see what type of tests they're going to send to us. Okay. So if it's a rapid PCR test, then that is, you know, that, that would be really that's an actual good. test. It's not just a screening device, and that's what we currently have right now. That's what the Abbott binary test is. It's uh, basically a, pre a screening tool, not an actual, okay, 100% positive, because as Ms. Kaufman mentioned, you still have to go and get, you know, and I don't want to use the word real test, but, mm -hmm. you know, an actual PCR test. It's antibody versus viral load. 
So an antibody, you had to have been sick for a long enough of a period to produce your own antibody. Mm -hmm. So if you've only been sick for 24 hours, you're not going to have enough antibodies. Whereas with the viral load, they can detect mm -hmm. that. It's just one extra measure to go. Like, like I said, um, if we were able to require these negative tests to come back, even though you've been vaccinated, it would just, I think, uh, help a lot of, it would lessen the exposure that we don't know if we're positive or not. That, that was one question I guess we can talk about later on. Uh, and then you said about the vaccines, and I was scrolling, this, writing this down. I know some other districts have talked about incentives uh, to their employees or to the kids who do get vaccines. Have we thought about anything like that, giving incentives for getting the vaccine? I've seen, uh, seen anything I've heard but through the grapevine, through the different professional organizations, there are some districts that are, you know, offering or planning to offer maybe like a hundred dollar bonus to anybody who's vaccinated. So, or not a not a bonus because that's I can't use that word. Sorry, on this, it's stipend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. a, a stipend bonus. There are other districts that have been talking about it. I haven't seen anything come through where they've actually, you know, brought it for approval. Okay. So, but we will we'll keep tabs on that for sure. Okay, and then the last, my last question, you said that the leave, because they have been asking me about this a lot, the last time we had the leave, it was 10 days that they had got, not the EFMLA, or, but the, just the regular, you, you've been exposed or you're sick, you get 10 days. Is that what you were talking about? If we uh, work with the resolution, we might be able to do that, depending on Andres? Well, I mean, it's definitely, you know, uh, the board could pass that resolution, but I'm sure that, you know, Mr. Sanchez would want, I, I'm sure that he needs to work to give you the actual cost uh, okay. of what that's going to cost before you make the decision. But if that's something that you're inclined to do, we can definitely, you know, redo the resolution and, and, and bring it to you also. But that would require y'all's action. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Rosa, you said the uh, air purifiers, are they in all the classrooms already? I know that Warehouse, uh, we're almost there. Uh, so the, the plan is to have them all in place uh, by the time all the kids get back. So they're, okay. they're working daily to get those out there. Okay. Mr. La Rosa. Yes, sir. I have a big question. What happens, you know, I, I, I heard a lot of those details that you uh, explained. What happens if we do have a student that uh, tests positive? With, uh, and, and there is no virtual learning, what's going to happen to that student? Are they just going to be missing instruction for that amount of days? Or do we have a plan B for that? There is an option that TA provides, and I'm going to let uh, Mr. Aguilar talk, speak to that a little bit. It's, it's not synchronous. It's more of like a conference, asynchronous type asynchronous. of instruction. And um, I believe Mr. Aguilar and his team are, are working on a solution to that. But I'll let him uh, okay. speak to that. So he's going to go over that later, or? Mr. Aguilar, you can address, proceed. Thank you, uh, Dr. Valdez, uh, members of the board. So yes, we did receive some guidance from TA on August the 5th regarding remote conferencing options for students. So <clears throat> there's going to be some options. It's going to be limited on the number of days. We're looking at a maximum of cumulative days, 20 during the school year that's going to allow. So one thing that we, we are discussing this already because once uh, they're going to have to meet some parameters. One, we're going to have to have a licensed physician within the United States to make that determination that they're going to be confined to the home. And of course, they're going to have to meet some other uh, criteria. But what we're looking at right now is it cannot be a teacher doing it concurrently or the teacher of record doing it at the same time. So we're going to have to either provide a substitute or we're going to have to get another teacher to provide that instruction once that child has been identified to receive instruction through remote conferencing. Okay. Now, are we, are we and I, I mean, I don't know if this is open for discussion yet or, or, or along the line, it's, it's all dealing with the virtual learning. So from what you from what you just mentioned, it's, so it's going to be limited access to the virtual learning right now, as of right now. That is correct, Coach Trevino. Right now, that is the guidance okay. that we're receiving from TEA, and it's a maximum. Should should it exceed, uh, then we're going to have to submit a waiver 
uh, the 20 days, we're going to have to submit a waiver, and TA will take it on a case-by-case -case basis from there. And if any, okay. we have any other information coming up, then uh, we will inform our administrators and our community and our board as soon as we receive that information. Okay, yes, because it is a big concern, obviously, with the increasing amount of cases that we have. So I think... Uh, I believe it's changed, like uh, uh, Mr. La Rosa said, it's changing on a daily basis. I believe we're still waiting for uh, Governor Abbott to make, the, I guess, the final decision on, on virtual learning or not. Well, the decision has already been made. However, uh, the governor and TEA can change at any time, so we have to be ready to pivot if that does happen and move forward with any of the recommendations moving forward. Now, I can foresee this happening even with teachers. I have to go home, but I feel fine. Can I teach from home through my Google Classroom? Is that something we can also look into? Right now, that is not an option no. that we have. Everyone's teaching face-to-face. -face. Okay. Uh, the only option that we have is right now the guidance that we received on August the 5th. And that is, you know, and we have a list of identifiable um, where the physician is going to make that determination and meet certain criteria. And once that criteria is determined, then we have to have that plan ready for that student. Okay. Okay, are we, I'm sorry, Jackie, are, are you still wrong? No, 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 go ahead. Are we able to use any of these ESSER funds to, to help us out if we did decide to go virtual? Or, you know, I mean, it's not, not through the, for the whole student population, but even even the sixth grade, you know, our elementary grades. Or, you know, if we start having some more and more cases, do we have that option to use some of those funds for, for, to, to compensate for whatever the state may decide to, to remove from us? That's a very good question, uh, Coach Trevino, and that we would have to go back and look at it carefully through allowables with the ESSER uh, to make that determination. I don't want to shoot from the hip from there. But right now, if we were to make that decision to go ver once school begins, uh, then we're in jeopardy of not receiving ADA funding. Okay, because I think that was the one district that's been uh, that's has information out already, Austin ISD. And they're implementing virtual classes as of, uh, let me, K through, for K, K through six, option available for families. Since they cannot get, since they're unable to get vaccines, that's their way around this. I have you know, I know that since everybody else is if everybody else has an option to uh, get vaccines, but children 12 and under cannot don't have that option. So what 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 Austin ISD is doing, they are offering, I believe, a, a controlled amount of virtual learning for students. And I don't know there, there's there's uh, information out there that we can I can forward to you tomorrow. But, uh, you know, I would really, I know there's, there's uh, still a big concern out to the community and, and this is something that I believe we still need to pay extra attention to because, uh, you know, with, because of the amount of growing cases that we have in our, in our community. Yeah, yes, Coach. I've, I have heard through, again, several professional organizations that there are some districts that are going to be offering a, a remote option. However, whether the financial situation is, whether they have, you know, adequate fund balance or, you know, monies in reserve, because they will not, as of right now, TA is not going to fund those students. Uh, or the, the, the district will not receive any ADA for those students that are, that are attending school remotely. So I'm not sure what their internal finances are, what they're doing, but, you know, that is de definitely a consideration on that. Right. We'd have to research and verify Austin ISD and see what the details as far as their district, right, to be able to offer. Um, so, Coach Trevino, we'll look into that and verify and see what um, 
what they're doing as far as being able to to offer that as an option. Okay, ma'am. I appreciate that, Dr. Yes. yes. As Thank he, you. As he mentioned, Alston ISD, Arab, I don't know how many times I got that screenshot, everyone sending it. Yes. It would be a good idea for Westlaco ISD just to ease the concerns and the fears because everyone says, Westlaco ISD, we're not going to do that. We're not going to contact Trace. We're not going to do this. If we can put that information out there, yes, we are. We're working on this. I'm sure it'll ease a lot of fears from parents and community that we are contact tracing and we'll let you know if you've been exposed within three feet. You know, if we can work on that, that would be good. Yes, and Mrs. Sustaita, we did, I did mention that to Cabinet this morning. I oh. said Austin ISD has a visual representation of exactly the wording of TEA's language on there, and they, like, strike it out, right? Yeah. Austin ISD will contact Trace. Austin ISD will. And so yes. um, I'm glad you're referencing that because we, we talked about it this morning, about okay. uh, providing something like that for the community, for uh, the school district. And parents to know, right? So that way right. everyone's um, well aware of what we are doing and how we're preparing. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Doc, Dr. Valdez, I would, I would like for us to look at, even if we had to use ESSER funds for this, the possibility, you know, to, to, to provide virtual learning and going ahead and using, using ESSER funds to do that you know, be, regardless if we have the funding or not, but I, I think uh, the safety of the, the, the kid is more more important than uh, than roofs or whatever that we, we may, other projects that we may be having going on with, with the ESSER funds. I think, uh, you know, these funds are available. We need to, to do whatever we can to provide the safety now and look at roofs or Whatever it may be that the additional things that we were looking at, uh, that can always, uh, we can always postpone that for later. But uh, I would like for us to look at those alternatives or, or the possibilities of using ESSER funds to compensate for any lost funding that, that the state may remove from us. Absolutely. Uh, my, yes, ma'am. And then my other, my other uh, question or is I, I just want to make sure, or statement is, I want to make sure all our campuses, you know, whether whether it's divided by elementary campuses, our junior high campuses and our high school campuses are all following one specific guideline for elementaries, one specific guideline, or, or specific guidelines for junior highs, as far as the information that we're getting out to the community. I know that was not the, the case previously, and I think uh, you know it it, um, it. it made for a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, for, uh, throughout the community. So I, I believe if we pass that message on by campuses and make sure all the teams for their for each specific campus is pushing the same message uh, for their respective grade levels, I think that that'll really help. Uh, lesson, you know, help lessen the, the, the panic mode for, for our community and so forth. So, yeah, I don't know what we can do to push that message across as well. Instead thank of you. everybody having their own individual plans. Yes, thank you so much, Coach Trevino. I so noted. Um, I appreciate your feedback and your input on that. We will look into ESSER funds to provide virtual. So, staff will um, begin that work as far as verifying that if, uh, if that's an option and um, and two we will um, push forward the same message we must be consistent throughout the yes. district in order for us to um, communicate effectively right we all have to be saying the same thing displaying the same um, content on whether it's posters, whatever, whatever um, literature is out there. It is vital and critical at this time that all campuses follow the same guidelines and then we're sending the same message. So um, administration will note that and we will move as quickly as we can in order to um, get that done, whether it's, you know, electronically, obviously on website and campuses and 
So, so noted. Coach Trevino, thank you so much for that input. So, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Doctor. And welcome. So, Dr. Valdez, if I may, just to answer a quick question on the Esther funds. Yes. Okay, so there's this, uh, on the FAQ for the remote conferencing, there's one question that says, LE, well, one example where it says LEAs with limited staffing options may consider, and one of the bullets says using ESSER funds to proactively hire additional staff members using ESSER funds. So it is an option, and that's something that we can look at. Uh, again, we'll go in accordance with the guidance from TA and what uh, the Governor Abbott rules allow, and then we'll proceed from there. Okay. Any Thank other questions? No, sir. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar. You're welcome, sir. All right. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar, for your help. Um, next, we have Dr. Sergio Garcia. Dr. Sergio Garcia, he um, was charged with the impact of COVID-19 on adults. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, we had a medical provider, physician, come in and, and discuss information regarding COVID-19 and with pediatrics, right? So uh, we've covered peds, now we need to cover the adults. And so here we have Dr. Armando Gutierrez, Dr. Sergio Garcia, you may proceed. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Valdez, uh, Mr. Cuellar, members of the board, that is correct. Uh, if you recall, right, shortly before we closed for the summer, we had Dr. Jocelyn Oaks who came uh, to talk to us about uh, pediatrics and COVID, um, and we are so grateful for her presentation on that day. And because we believe that we need to bring the experts to talk to our community, um, we are honored to have Dr. Uh, Armando Gutierrez, who's with the Stroman and Gutierrez family practice, um, who will talk to us or give us an update on COVID and its impact on adults. Um, and at the very end, Dr. Gutierrez will also take any questions from you or any of the audience um, if they have any very, very important questions that need to be asked of him. So, Dr. Gutierrez, again, thank you so much for being here. We are honored, and the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, board, uh, board president, vice president, distinguished board members. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak uh, today. Um, the clinic and I, we've been practicing ever since COVID first came out. We never closed down. Um, it's been a tremendous uphill battle, and I commend you all and all the efforts you're making to try and make sure that the return to school is, is a safe and, and fruitful one for all our children and all our teachers and everyone involved. Uh, it's definitely been uh, an uphill battle trying to figure out what's the best way to care for our community. Uh, resources have been very, very short at times. Uh, as a physician, we've always basically had to treat every patient on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. Um, it wasn't long after it started that we started to notice that, you know, the elderly population was definitely being hit the hardest. Uh, and then as once we get under the age of 65, we started noticing that it was mainly adults who had severe co comorbidities, uh, severely overweight, uncontrolled diabetes, heart disease, any underlying cancer treatments, things of that nature, they had a much higher, uh, harder time dealing with it. Children have always been able to kind of slip through. Uh, they've been been able to get through. Uh, many, you know, we've had I've had patients. They come four or five children in one vehicle. The parents will be sick, and children never catch it. Uh, so it's always been a blessing to go because it's hard to see children sick, I and mean, that's always something we never want to deal with. Um, but it's one of those things that, you know, we, we always have to prepare as much as possible. And, and I think um, everything that you've put into it to prepare for that is, is, is great. Uh, it is a daunting task that, that you're faced with, having so many children together and all in one place. Um, as a physician, when I get patients that check in on a daily basis, what catches my eye uh, is basically that, their age. When I see their age, if I see somebody coming in, they're over the age of 65, I, that's where I'm most concerned. Under the age of 65, it, the, the amount that COVID's gonna affect them dramatically drops off. Of course, there are comorbidities and we always have to keep an eye out for those. And so we're always looking for those and we're always basically you know, doing our best to pick up the, the conditions early, but we have so many that are just asymptomatic. And so we have to do their screening. And we, we do our screening with antigen testing um, and 
until we started noticing that antigens was sometimes missing um, COVID diagnosis. And that's something we've always known because antigen testing early on can miss up to three days, you know, into the into what's called the prodrome before you actually get all your symptoms. Uh, after that, it becomes much more uh, sensitive, but it can still miss up to 15%. So uh, we've invested in molecular testing to, to try and offer that and, and be, you know, as, as proactive as possible for our community to try and give as much information to our patients and, um, you know, to their parents so that they can make the correct decisions on their own. Uh, everyone is different. And my recommendation is always that if, you know, if a parent has a concern about their child, one of the best things you can do is go to who knows your child's health the best, and that's their PCP. Have them take a look at them, make some recommendations about how safe they can be in school uh, with the given precautions that the school has available. Uh, and that will help you know, on, on an individual basis as to whether that child would be in a safe environment. 99% uh, of the children out there, if they were to get sick, you know, or out of every 100 children that get sick, one to two might get sick enough to be hospitalized. The other 98 are gonna go through it, and often they, they have symptoms as mild as just allergies or sniffles or no symptoms at all. Um, so COVID has always been, you know, it, a, a condition of the elderly and now, with this Delta variant coming out, it's becoming more of a condition of the unvaccinated. So, um, we are closely monitoring. We have definitely seen a spike in COVID cases, COVID positive cases. We were really, really liking the trend we, were, we had three weeks ago. I mean, it was getting down to where we even went a couple of weeks with one to two cases. And then all of a sudden, we we're seeing a, a huge spike in numbers. Now, the one the one comforting thing is that the disease itself has not drastically changed from what we were previously seeing. And Delta variant basically means that the, the virus is trying to mutate, it's trying to survive. And so it has changed on how quickly it can jump from person to person. But the actual pathogenicity, how, how sick it can make a person hasn't changed much. So that's good. So the vaccines are still working, uh, they're producing antibodies so that people can fight off the infection quicker. And we're almost at that number in the state of Texas, we're almost approaching uh, what's, what's considered the T-naught value, which is once we get approximately 55 to 60% of the population vaccinated, then COVID should dramatically drop off because it has a hard time finding a new host. The more and more that people are vaccinated and including those who have survived COVID, they build up their own natural immunity. Um, then that makes it harder and harder for this, this virus to persist. So uh, I wanted to make myself available um, to the board, uh, my medical expertise, my medical knowledge, uh, for any questions you might have. And, and uh, as a member of the community, I have both my daughters in school. Uh, they went to school last year. Um, I love this school district. Uh, it's fantastic. I came from a small town here in the valley. Uh, Wesco has always been great to me, uh, great to my hometown, which is Raymondville. Um, always have, have welcomed us, um, you know, throughout the, throughout the years of different situations we've had in my small community. So I really pride myself in being part of this community and um, at your service. I guess I'll get started just with the question. Thank you for coming and speaking to us today. Really appreciate it. My concern I, as a, a parent or even as, you know, an ex-staff member, the people who have been vaccinated, they're asymptomatic, right? So we, they might be carrying something, but they don't know it. We, they're already around everybody else by the time they find out. Those people who are willing to say, you know what, yes, I'll take a weekly test or buy, what do you recommend for the people who do want to screen themselves? Is it, would it be good, a good thing to do it weekly, every two weeks? What, what would be a good time frame to do that? So it, it depends on exposure. Um, okay. You know, when, when someone's vaccinated, um, it's a grayscale. Some people have a very high reaction to the vaccine. They produce plenty of antibodies. So much to the, to the effect that if a viral particle were to invade their body, their body can actually completely coat that virus and actually just completely neutralize it. But then you have the other side of the grayscale where they, 
get a very small production of, of antibodies and they're gonna have symptoms because it, it basically takes their body longer to mount uh, a reaction and fight back against, against that invading virus. So that's where the, the, you know, the, the grayscale is with each and every person. So the healthier you are, the more rest you get, uh, all of that plays a, plays a role in it. How well hydrated you are, what medications you are, comorbidities. That's why it's individual for each one. It, it's not gonna hurt you to get tested weekly. Uh, that is objective data. That is one way to say yes or no and have some, some form of proof. And these, these are microscopic, invisible, odorless, tasteless, critters that are basically trying to get us and, and there's, you know, to, to try and base it on symptoms, it's hard. You know, recently we had, we had a freeze that killed a ton, ton of trees and then followed by rain and then we had Saharan dust and so we have all these things that are causing, you know, the same symptoms that COVID is causing and so it's, it gets really hard and the only way, even as, as a physician with years of experience, is to get the actual test so that we have something to, to base a decision on. And okay. so if the school district does have something to that effect, um, it would be, you know, of course, insurance issues and things like that would also dictate, but um, that, would, that would be an objective way to, to be able to, to determine, you know, how everybody's, how everybody's doing. Just as if you had high blood pressure, you check your blood pressure, you know, to see how you're doing. You don't wait till you have a headache. You monitor right. it, and then that'll give you a better idea. Excellent. So the rapid antigen is the, is, is is quick. Um, within the first three days, it can miss um, miss the the detection of the virus. The when you're talking about PCR molecular technology, that's actually looking for the DNA RNA um, sequences, or in this case, RNA sequences of the virus. So that's a much more detailed. Unfortunately, it's a longer test. The quickest turnaround on that is about 30 to 45 minutes. So when you're talking about many people, then you, you definitely have a bottlenecking effect on, on that test. Is that something if we did in the evening after school, they would have the results by the next morning? Yes, ma'am. Is that something we have that TEA gave us last year? Those rapid tests? No, we don't have those. What is the cost? Can you answer what the cost is for the you know the cost of the, the testing to do it? Uh, the actual machine itself? Yes. Um, we, we purchased... Um, 10 machines, and uh, each machine, depending on the distributor, can cost up to $10,000. Um, so that's unfortunately the, the technology is, is there to, it's a great technology, but it's, it's not, it's not uh, very readily available. Okay. Dr. Gutierrez, so just to clarify, you know, uh, thank you for being here for so long. Absolutely. All, so if somebody gets exposed, you know, they don't want to get tested right away. It's a three-day um, waiting period before they, they, it's recommended that they get tested? It is because of the fact that you can have a false negative. Okay. Uh, when this virus gets, say you breathe it in, gets in your nose, it has to replicate. Uh, we manually go in there, we, we brush the nose trying to get a sample. And you can imagine if, say, somebody in the hallway was, was sick, you walked right past them, there's... You might get one viral particle in there. It hasn't had a chance to really replicate, and you can miss it. After three days, you, that virus has had enough time to actually produce and, and multiply, and the chance of physically missing it goes way down. So while that person waits for three days after exposure here at school working, they haven't, uh, con you know, they haven't given it to anybody else while they wait for those three days, or is it contagious during those three days while they show up? That's where basically the, the program, the, the virus hasn't had enough time to build up enough to where they start becoming contagious. They're, they're completely asymptomatic usually. And then once they become symptomatic, start sneezing, coughing, then that's where you're actually starting to shed that or spread that virus by, by shedding. Uh, and the virus has had enough time to replicate. It's gonna be on the aerosolized droplets when you cough, uh, sneeze, when you cough in your hands and you touch you know, things. The virus is fairly delicate outside the body, but it, it has been known to live 
several hours on different surfaces, and that's why the hand sanitizer is always rec you know recommended. Right. You know, these masks are, are very good at blocking airflow, and that's that's the originally they're recommended for anyone who's sick, so that they're not. You know, with, with for example, the plexiglass you have in front of you, that's so that if I were sick and I cough, it, it physically blocks the airflow, right. which is carrying those particles. These masks are blocking, you know, someone sick from coughing and spreading it out more. Uh, so that's that's the, the benefit of them. Very good information. Thank you so much. Doc, one more question. Any information on, on boosters? What, what's the talk on that? So the most recent information is... Um, Basically, the CDC, the NIH, uh, um, they've all gotten together. They're currently reviewing all the information. Um, so, you know, we had three vaccines that were out. Um, Pfizer and Moderna are pretty much neck and neck as to how efficacious they are. You know, Pfizer provided immunity to 95%. So out of every 100 people that get the vaccine, 95 are going to make antibodies. But you're going to have about five that don't. Um, and then Johnson & Johnson was down at about 70%, which means if you got Johnson & Johnson, there's a 30% chance you didn't make antibodies to that, to that uh, vaccine. So they're reviewing the data, trying to come up with the best step forward. Um, we have had some patients that have uh, received both doses uh, and have come in for antibody testing and have tested negative, indicating that they didn't mount a response to the vaccine, which means that they're still susceptible to getting the full, uh, the full effects of the virus if it affected them. So the vaccine, you know, gets you ready to fight the virus. If you're vaccinated and you produce antibodies, the moment you get infected, your body's already fighting back. If you're not vaccinated, it can take you seven to 10 days before you start fighting back and if you have other health conditions, that's a long ways to go um, on your own before you're able to kind of push back so it can really, really beat you down. And that's what causes people to end up in the, in the ICU, causes people to end up in, in the hospital. Doctor. Thank you. In terms of uh, boosters, what's the uh, timeline from the time you got vaccinated to the availability of a booster before you can get there? So that's, that's one of the things that they're working on right now. Uh, each vaccine basically has its own patented way of, of working. They're messenger RNA vaccines, so um, they're, they're reviewing the data. So every time somebody gets vaccinated, they give you the information there to report back. Uh, also, if anybody has an adverse reaction, they go to their physician, they get treated, that gets reported as well uh, as to issues that, that we're having. So issues of basically people not mounting, you know, responses is also being reported back. Mm -hmm. um, and so once they have enough collective data, they'll be able to say, you know, a certain percentage of the population is going to need boosters um, to make sure that they're mounting an immunity. And, and will that booster be vaccine specific? That's going to be, um, we're, we have to wait. Um, the, the most recent information that I have um, included all three sources, and that was the CDC, the NIH, um, and the FBA, FDA, sorry, uh, all got together, and that's the most current information I have. They have not decided on a booster mm -hmm. uh, as of yet. What about for, is there any news on, on any vaccine for, for the kids, the ones in, you know, the elementary, the 12 and under? Is there any news on that? There is no, uh, at this moment, no, no, there's not a recommendation. And the reason is because they are so unlikely to have an issue with COVID uh, that the, the pros and cons, um, you know, it, it doesn't favor in, in their benefit. Children are, are just going right through this predominantly asymptomatic. I uh, don't have any symptoms at all. And I have grandparents all the time. They bring, you know, the grandchildren. And they're so relieved that the grandchildren tested negative. And I always tell them, I'm more relieved that you tested negative because if they were to get it, they, you know, they're still going to be jumping around playing and, and uh, not have any issues. But the grandparents are the ones that are much more likely to end up yeah. in a hospitalized situation. Okay. Doctor. Hello, Doctor. Appreciate Hello. you coming out. I, I have a question, and I, I know we were, were 
referring to adults, but along the lines of kids, since we're talking about uh, students or kids, what about socially and emotionally for those kids? You know, I know, you know, half of the population probably wants to keep them at home. The other half wants to send them on the end. I have a nine-year-old myself. I, I, I'm, I'm for sending them in, you know, because I could just see the transformation in her. I was able to notice the transformation in her when we sent her in, I believe, last year in April, I believe, mm-hmm. and uh, versus having her just stuck on the computer at home and the effectiveness of, of her being there in person versus in the computer. What What is it? I mean, just if you can share your professional opinion on that, um, you know, for the, for the community. Absolutely. Um, I saw the same, same effects. Children uh, are, it is extremely important for them to socialize with other children. Uh, they need to pick up on cues and they need to pick up on interactions. Um, it's important for them to be around the adults, but it's also they gain a lot of, of their education from their peers. They need to interact with their peers. They need to see new things. Their brain is just developing so rapidly, uh, especially before the age of seven. Um, and I always tell them, you know, one, of the, one form of punishment is, is isolation. That's used by the corporal system. It's used by, you know, because that's, we're, we're, highly, we're highly intelligent individuals that require socialization. We need to communicate with one another. We need to get out. We need to see new things. Uh, being confined to one room, one home uh, with no changing, um, environment is very, very tough on children. And so many parents, um, me included, I saw in my own little girls that they would just start hitting a wall. You know, they, they've been with me and my wife in our clinic um, since COVID started. So we have, we have no other relatives here in, in, in West Waco. So they were with us. Um, and towards the end of the school year last year, we started hitting a wall to where about two o'clock in the afternoon, it didn't matter how often we reminded them to do their work, to sit down, to, they just could not. They could not maintain that focus. They had to get up and move. Uh, and that was, they, they, they reached their max. And so we made the decision last year to get them back in school. And they immediately um, changed their behaviors. They immediately started to show how much they appreciated it. They, they interacted well with, with you know, the, the students that were there. And that part of, of, of their development is extremely important. So that's... And if I could add um, mm-hmm. social emotional learning, Coach um, Trevino has always yeah. been an, a, a vital component as far as the whole child, right? Um, even pre-COVID, um, schools should, school systems should have been integrating social emotional learning into the daily curriculum. Um, not and now now it's more important than ever Mm -hmm. um the children need to feel some sense of normalcy we're social beings we need each other um so that is something that um staff administration will will um surely um target because of the need right for social emotional well-being uh not only of students, but also of faculty and staff and administration, the adults in the in the school system as well. Mm-hmm. But um, that's always been important, especially to me, um, social emotional learning. So it's something that we're going to have to target. So coach, thank you for uh, mentioning that because it is an important component that we will need to um, target. Yes, thank you very much, doctor, for that, and, and uh, or both doctors. Thank you for all that information. We appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you. Coach, anyone else? No, sir. Doctor Gutierrez. Thank you so much. Yes, right. Dr. Gutierrez, thank you, thank you so much thank for you. the information. Thank you. thank you for what you do for our community, and thank you on behalf of all of us for being in the front lines for us. No, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay, Mr. President, the next, the final bulleted item is insurance, and I'm going to call on uh, Mr. De La Rosa. Mr. De La Rosa, you may proceed. 
Thank you, Dr. Valdez. Again, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is the uh, standard uh, self-funded health insurance slide that I uh, show every month. This is data through July 31st, uh, 2021. So I'm going to go ahead and approximate the numbers just to kind of um, make things flow a little easier. So as far as medical claims um, uh, for this year versus last year, this year we're at $9.4 million. Last year at this time we're at about $7.7 .7 million. That's an increase of approximately $1.7 million uh, for the year for actual medical claims, doctor visits, procedures, et cetera. Uh, prescription drugs, uh, last year at this time we're at $5.2 million. Uh, this year we're at $6.3 million uh, in prescription drug costs. I've been talking about this over the past year. It's been, you know, uh, uh, it's raising a red flag. Our total spend for prescription drugs for the 1920 plan year uh, was $5,685,928.36. We've already surpassed that and we've got one month left uh, in our plan year. Our fixed costs have been pretty, have maintained pretty consistent, uh, 2.3 last year. Uh, this year we're at $2.2 million. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, this year, everything included, we spent just a little over $18 million uh, versus last year at $15.3 million. So it's an approximate 18% increase. Uh, that total is net of our stop loss claims that we filed, and that's been about $3.4 million. Um, this is our standard self-funded workers' comp. Again, we do comparison this year versus last year. Uh, the number of claims last year through July was at 60. Uh, we're at 61 this year. So the amount that we've incurred uh, is at 177, 942.99 versus last year. We're at uh, a little over $212,000. And of course, we've already paid out of that uh, 177,000. Uh, we've already paid $106,714. And uh, leaves us with uh, 71,228.99 that we have to hold in reserves to go ahead and finish out uh, these claims. So we're doing very well in a, doing very well in a workers' comp um, program. And if it, the board has any questions, Mark, no questions. Mike, thank you. Thank you, thank Coach. You. Mr. President, this concludes Superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Valdez. We now go to. Item 9, Consent Agenda. Uh, have a look at the, the items and I'll, I'll, I'll call to see if y'all want to pull anything. Is Jackie suspect them? No. Okay. None? No. Dr. Hammond, are you? I have none, Coach. Mr. Mark Taylor Hunter? Adam Q. Okay, they are. You have letter two? Q. Just one. Okay, which uh, one? Letter Q. Oh, letter Q. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I said you said oh. two. Letter Q. Coach Trevino? I want to pull item P, number one. Item number one. Item P. P is in number one. Okay. Okay, we have a. Uh, I'll make a motion. Make a motion. I'll make a motion, Coach, to approve the consent agenda with the exception of P1 and Q. I'll okay. second. Got yeah, second by uh, Jackie. Let's uh, take it to a vote. Signify your approval by saying aye when I call your name. Ms. Aye. Coach Jay Trevino? Aye. Dr. Jaime Rodriguez? Aye. And Mr. Mark de los Santos? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Now, let's entertain the uh, items that were pulled. <clears throat> Mark? 
Yeah, Mr. Los Santos, you have uh, item Q. Okay. Um, my first question, I guess, will go to Mr. Andres. Sanchez. Sir, what are the protocols, what are some of the controls that we have for items, for bids that are 50,000 or more? We, in your we office? Have, we go out for proposals. You go out for proposals? Yes, sir. Okay. The only reason I, I pulled this item was one because it, it was, it didn't have, it didn't go out, it didn't have any proposals that were, because it says here, number of vendors that were asked to submit proposal NA, submitted a proposal NA, but one of the things that caught my eye was it says here estimated number of games at 126. There's 126 games and it's covering events such as sub varsity freshman football, uh, West Coast High and East football games for middle schools, varsity. So oh, varsity soccer uh, for both high schools, varsity track, etc. Wrestling, powerlifting. So it has 126 games total and 275 hours. And, and when you do the math, that's about two hours per event. Mm -hmm. But some of these events have medical coverage that are longer, don't they? Like track and field events, those are usually like an all-day event. Uh, football games, I know, uh, usually run more than two hours as far as from, from start to finish for medical services and whatnot. So I was just kind of curious on, on how did this come to be where, where it's at a total of 275 hours? Uh, did they use uh, previous years, uh, totals, and budget? So Yes. Yes, uh, this is already just, this just is a renewal contract. Mm -hmm. We did a proposal last year. Okay. We renew and we have the proposal number at the top on the title. We had two companies awarded last year. Right. We contacted them. One of the companies said they were not interested in renewing. No, actually, the company is out of business, so we couldn't get a hold of anybody on that. So we only have one company. We spoke to Coach Javier Banuelos from his high school. Mm -hmm. He's the one that was involved with this, and uh, they all were comfortable and happy with the services the company provided. And they uh, recommended to renew. But last year, so last year they were under 200. They were at 275. That, that's my question. They were at 275 hours or under the last year. Like the previous previous uh, history, as far as services that we pay for, yeah. it, it's under 50,000. Yes, uh, yes, sir. And th this is the estimate of what they gave us. Some of the middle school games take less time. Mm -hmm. And this is middle school and high school. That's what this is the amount of hours he estimated it would take for this year. And so, and he, you're saying that they estimated those hours based off of previous years, uh, what we've yes, spent and the, and the number of hours yes, that, that, that we've accumulated over 126 games. Mm -hmm. yes. a lot, the average of two hours of medical service per game. Two hours or a little bit more, yes. <clears throat> okay. No, that's, I just wanted to make sure because I just saw, you know, it was kind of a concern because I thought that's, I thought we had medical services for longer. Because um, yeah. I know that that'll push it over the fifty thousand dollar threshold. That's what I'm saying. And then, but then you have to go out and get actually three bids. Even if it goes over, there is not a problem. But we will, we will go out. We did go out for proposals previously. Year one, yes. So this is an extension of that. So even if we go to sixty thousand or seventy, doesn't matter. I'm not saying to go over, but if we go over, that is not a problem. Because we did go out for proposals, and we had the option to extend, and we are exercising the option to extend the, the award. Would you be able to provide, uh, as a follow-up, an, an actual number of uh, the expense that went into this last year? Yes. yes Even okay. though last year there wasn't too many oh, yeah, games, COVID. but right. maybe right. the year so, before, just to kind of actual versus mm -hmm. estimated amounts? Sure. We can put it in the update. Okay. Not a problem. Okay, good. Mike. Um, Hello. Yes, okay, uh, Coach Avino, uh, on yes, item. Yes, uh, Mr. Sanchez. Mr. Sanchez, this was a concern of mine too, but I, I didn't want to repeat item Q since uh, Mark had already mentioned it. But this is a concern to me as well. I highlighted this uh, as I was looking over the packet this weekend. Again, because the hours do not add up. And I can, I can hear what you're saying, Mr. Sanchez, that because uh, this is an extension, my, my only concern is, or my question is, why would why would we not open this up for RFQs? Why are you guys making the decisions yourself? Uh, why not give us that option? I know you gave us a lot of options on a lot of other other items for RFQs. Why take it upon yourself to say, hey, we're going to keep this company and they're doing a good job, blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to tell you right now, and, and I would also like a report 
as far as to how much we paid to this company. Were they were they servicing our not not this past year, not for 2020, but what about for two, uh, 2019? Was was that the same company? I believe so. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. I want to see what the expenditure, how much they invoiced us for year 2019, 2020. Because I've been a coach all my life. Events do not last on an average two hours. You have wrestling tournaments that last six to eight hours. You have track that lasts six to eight hours. Track meets that last six to eight hours. And I'm talking about junior high. Junior high may last four to six hours. These hours that you present here do not add up. And to me, to me these are like false numbers. You're, you're presenting us something here, and I and I really hope that that when, when you present to us for the 2019-2020, that that expenditure is close to this forty-eight thousand dollars. Because I, if we're going to work on estimates, they need to be fairly accurate if that's what we're going to do. But I I don't see how this is going to be even close to this right here. I know right now you you uh, I heard you say seventy thousand. You know, I, I am very curious to see what this cost is to us because I, I just when this was a big red flag when I was going over it because I it, it, the 126 just to me none of those numbers add up. So if you can get that information to us, that would be great. I would like to. Uh, I guess uh, I'll wait for I'll, I'll wait for when we vote on this. I guess. Yes, Coach I would Sorino. like to not take any action on this. We'll, we'll provide it in the update. So, so is he asking the table? Is it that I heard not to take action? Coach, are you asking, well, are you asking can, that we can table we, this item? Are we, Mr. Mr. Guayar, are we able to just hire him on a, put this contract on hold and just hire him on a uh, week to week or month to month until all this information is presented to us? And if it's accurate and, and the estimate numbers are accurate, so be it. Then we will renew the will renew the extension. But if it's not, at that point, I would like to reopen this up for RFQs. Are we in a position to council? You can table the item if you want. No, but yet we can. Yes. We can continue. We, we need the services. So as long as we provide okay. the service, because we, we need the services. We need the service. service. I'd rather not table it, continue like, like you said, and now. Well, uh, the, the concern is we, we started the school year already. Uh, right. We're, we're <laughs> practicing, to, and, and uh, should something happen, we, we do need ambulance service. So. Correct. So yes. what, you're, yes. what you're suggesting, Coach, is that we go ahead and, and take it on a, on a case per case uh, uh, situation? Is that an option? Yes, I have yes. Hire them on a week to week, because I know we have scrimmages coming up this weekend and, yep. and mm -hmm. so forth. So hire them on a week to week until we, we are presented with the numbers and then we can move forward yeah. either with, you know, the extension or with RFQs. Yeah, okay. Because to me, this has nothing to do with the company itself, but our internal controls. Because, you know, like yeah. I said, anything over $50,000, we need to submit three bids. And so we just want to make sure that the proposals are as accurate as possible. And, and like I said, this was kind of a concern. I, I don't have the experience as, as everyone else as far as athletics or, or, or running those kind of programs, but I do know that they do take longer than two hours. And so that was kind of a concern as well for me. I saw that, and, and the math just didn't add up. No, I, I understand. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want it to make it look like we're getting the numbers close below 50,000, so we don't have to go out for proposals. Right. Like I said, this is an actual proposal. We went out last year. Mm -hmm. We had the option to extend, and we bring it to the board to extend. It's up to the board to approve it or not. Right. But that is why we did it. The company that we recommended, we had worked with them before by themselves without having an extra company. Right. So we were comfortable with them because they've done service for us for many years. And Coach okay. Manuel is the one that provided the recommendation, not me or my department. Right. But so we will provide, the, provide information the, update, the, update. the actual cost in the yeah. update? Yeah, we will. Um, and uh, and so as long as we have coverage. Um, for the games, right, as we go. Right. No problem. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Okay. Um, what about uh, Part B, approval of proposed awards, Coach Sorry, uh, I, uh, 
My only concern here on this one here is notice looking at the differences on the total awarded points. Uh, obviously, there was a big red flag two years ago or a year and a half ago with this with this company. I just want to make sure. You know, I noticed down at the bottom one of the bullets is asking for only one quote will be required if the amount of purchase is less than $500. My concern here is if we go back and look at for the past two or three years, and they had, you know, they had multiple companies listed and so forth, but it, would, it was almost appearing, appearing like everything was being funneled to one company. And I want to make sure all these companies on here have a, have a fair opportunity to provide their service or their items or whatever they're selling. So I, I would like to remove that bullet number one or, or less than that amount instead of saying $500, anything under a hundred dollars, you know, or, or $200. But not $500. So that, that's my concern. That, that is fine. Just for your information, last year we had it at 3000 A lot of our proposals, we had them at $3,000. If it was 3000 or less, or less than 3000 no, only one quote. More than three, three quotes. So we went down to 500 to make it more restrictive. But the board wants to make it 200 or 300 we'll, or less. We'll take it whatever the board decides. We'll yeah, let's go ahead, if, if, if you guys don't mind, like, let's go ahead and just 250 anything under 250 we, uh, we will accept one quote, anything above 350 we will require three quotes. I don't that know is, how everybody else feels about that. Yeah, we're, once upon a time we went with 300, if you remember in there, so we used to go with 300, Any a, anything that was 300, we, we had to get at least three quotes. Yeah, what would, uh... But, I'm talking about that. So, Coach yes. is asking for 250. Yeah, that's fine. No Three, 300 is fine, Coach, but just 500 is, 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 is you know, 500 okay. will add up very quickly if you don't okay. have to. Is everybody for okay with 300? That's fine with me. We're fine? Okay. So, on item one, we just want to go and, and uh, re, um, revisit the, uh, the the amount to set it at, at 300. Okay? okay. We'll so, uh, I'm going to. Bring it to a vote that on item P1, that we visit the amount of $300 for three quotes, or, or we'll require three quotes at $300. Mm -hmm. And on item Q, that uh, we approve a week-to-week uh, -week, uh, fee for, for the ambulance service. Can we have a motion, Pete? please? I make a motion. I'm, I'm, I'm putting, so, do we have a motion mm -hmm. by Dr. I make a motion. Jesse? You make a, a motion, second by. I'll Here. second. Second by Mr. Los Santos. Mm -hmm. Two. So no more discussion on that because I, I was going to I was going to ask something, but no, no more discussion. That, that's it. Once we vote. Because yeah, I'm, I'm uh, okay. For a vote. I was going because so because the principals are here. I was going discuss. to ask <laughs> something, but I don't know. With all due respect, they just made the motion in the second so they can still yeah. continue. Okay, we, we went to my Jackie. You can so. allow Jackie to speak. Um, Go ahead and speak, Jackie. I the, can motion, speak. Can speak. the motion and second? Okay. Yes. She can speak. Before, can the, before the vote. Yes. Because I, I'm seeing here the, the rationale that superintendent says, <clears throat> the school principals were asked to evaluate and score each vendor based on the criteria. And I see that a lot of the principals are here. And it goes, there's a lot of work that goes into we want this, you know, quick, and we're waiting for quotes. And I hear my my co not coworkers anymore, but I hear people tell me, you know what? Oh, it, it's kind of taking long. It's been a lot. It's a lot of work. The principals are here, and they're the ones that I are the ones who who use, who have to get the quotes for their schools. Correct. So is it? Uh, does it delay a lot more the process of getting what you need to you? Because you're getting more quotes, or does it? Is it the same time frame that you're looking at? Uh, no, it it, it it takes a little longer for them. Mm -hmm. It's more it tedious. Long, it takes quote, longer. Right. Of course. Yeah, if what they're gonna buy happened to be three fifty, now they get need to get three quotes. If it was three fifty and it was five hundred, the limit, then 
They only mm -hmm. need one quote. Because I understand that we, we want to be fair, but I also understand that sometimes we have a time frame and we need things and we want to get it done. And I'm delayed now because I have to wait for three quotes. So it's, you know, it's, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah it takes longer for them and then for us to evaluate them as well. We need to make sure that what they selected is correct. That they selected three quotes and why did they go with this one? Is it the lowest price or can they deliver faster or what is it that they decided mm -hmm. on? Well, I see he, uh, that Embroidery Express was ranked as number one. I don't know if I can... Oh, all, all of them are one. Mm -hmm. They're all, all of them are one. Oh, okay. Primary, HDL, yeah. Proforma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they all sorry, I don't know if I can see one. it or not. Correct. So all the, prin the principals are here. Is there a reason... Sh can we just um. use different vendors or do we all go with the oh, no, same no, no. one? Whomever they want. If it's, like, in this case, 300. If it's 299, they can go to any vendor they want. If it's 300, they have to select at least three of those. They don't have to go to all six. Just three of the six, if it's 300 or more. Less than 300, they can go to the one they want. Because of experience, whomever delivers faster, has better quality. Now, they ranked them. We had samples out of the company that we got. Only one didn't provide samples, so we had them on uh, the business office and the conference table, conference room. And they all came, principals or the uh, facilitator, some same secretaries. They looked at them. They looked the quality of what they had. And based on that and the experience they had with them before, Mm -hmm. And the price, they were ranked, and that's how the ranking came up. So the top six were recommended. Mm -hmm. They all got points. They had to have points to cut off, make a limit. Mm -hmm. but so everybody just kind of goes to who you used before. I got them here last time, so I'm just going to go with them again. That's kind of uh, what happens? Well, uh, they might if they <laughs> like the service they got. I'm you know, sometimes <laughs> when you get something and the quality of the service is not there, you don't want to go with them again right. the next time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you get good quality, and the price is as good, you go, you go with them. Based on their history. Right. And business office is excellent about including principals, campus principals, oh, yeah, as far as the input, as far as um, the services and, and providing help in ranking, uh, scoring, rating the, mm -hmm. the vendors. Mm -hmm. So they, and, they've uh, done an excellent job in providing the and, principals that opportunity. And the, the issue is not so much getting the quotes and everything. It's taking time to process the purchase order. Cause right. Uh, we need to be working on a timely manner. I know we have a lot of challenges and a lot of things going on, but any time that anything's turned in, it, it, it's, it's going to be important to, to process those uh, those uh, purchase orders so that they can get equipped. No, and, and, and we do. As things come in, uh, requisitions come in, they're, they're assigned to the four members of the purchasing department, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the sequen they're in sequential number. Mm -hmm. Whoever comes next, that's the one that they do next. They don't go pull this one or pull that one. We have some times when we have emergencies. They say, I need yes. something. Else. What's the requisition number? We go pull it out. They look at it, and if it's correct, we process it. But other than that, they come in. That's how we handle are, it. Are you still doing walkthroughs? We try not to. And that, those are the emergencies that I said. OK. Well, in, 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 in the case of, of, of an emergency, Don't we need this it. now. Yes. You know, can. Yeah, no, we, we, and they, they do the requisition, uh, and we tell, they tell them, send us an email. Mm -hmm. send it, we say send it to the purchasing director, the bookkeeper, who's working on it from the purchasing department, okay. and then my secretary and myself. So if they don't see it, we see it, we'll remind them, we check on it. Okay. And the and key is for it to be correct. Yes. For it to it, be timely. Otherwise, if there are, you know, um, errors or anything that, that um, the creator of that PO needs to go back yes. and correct, then obviously you run into delays. So the key is to be correct. correct. That's the main Absolutely. thing, the delays and the timeliness. Yeah. Yes, that's what I was concerned about. <clears throat> but okay. okay. My, my, my concern with this, Dr. or and, and uh, Mr. Saita was, I, and I know you, you just came in, Dr., but my concern with this and why I voiced uh, expressive concern is when, and then obviously this is all public information, but uh, a year and a half ago, one of, I know there's the, the balance or the, 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 the balance, I guess, projected for this or the estimate for this uh, for the trophies and awards and all that was $500,000 set aside was for spending this amount. Well, out of those $500,000 that were set aside yearly, one year, and obviously I, I'm not as fresh on, my, my, on the information because it's been a while, but... One year, we spent $427,000 of that to one company. The prior year, 
prior to that year, we spent three hundred and ninety-seven thousand dollars to that company. You know, prior to that year, we spent another four hundred thousand dollars to that company. So, do you, do you understand what my concern is? We're not spread. We're not spreading the wealth here. We're not utilizing all the companies. And I know, I, I know it may take a little bit more time. It's a little bit more tedious, but. You know, I think proper plan, good planning, you know, the only time we ran into problems when we're ordering most of our equipment, most of our whatever is ordered, you know, during uh, when the time, the season's coming up or, or what have you. But, you know, the only time we ran into problems was playoffs and we wanted to get playoff shirts or, or whatever during that time. But most of the time, you know, I know we host a, powerlifting uh, events here and we those medals are ordered with with plenty of time almost uh months in advance so uh i don't think it, it would run into that problem but i uh, my concern is is uh is is uh is more i guess more based off of that instead of the you know how i, I know it can be tedious placing uh asking for bids and so forth. I, I did it for those seven years. I was there for seven years, 20 years I've been coaching. But I, when uh, I see those types of red flags, I think we do need to pay attention to to, the, to our bidding system here. Okay. Well, Coach, thank you. And uh, are we ready to yes. vote on the um, on the items? Okay. We, we had a uh, motion by Coach, second by Mark, to uh, get a $300 quote. Or when we get $300 to get the three quotes on item uh, P1 and on item Q, that uh, until we decide, uh, we will <clears throat> go on a week to week basis on the uh, on the fees paid for the ambulance service. Okay, let's take it to a vote. Signify your approval by saying aye when I call your name. Mr. Stata? Aye. Costa Domingo? Aye. Dr. Rodriguez? Aye. And Mr. Los Santos? Aye. Okay, motion carries. We now go to discussion items. Item 10, discussing a possible action. A, discussing a possible action for the board to endorse a nominated individual from another school board within our TASB district to fill a position on the TASB board of directors, position A and position B. Dr. Valdez. So um, the Board of Trustees must uh, recommend or endorse a nominated individual. And you have the uh, candidates listed in your board packet. And it, so you will and have it's from to one, from, one uh, from, from position A, position, position B. Position A and position B. I'll make a motion uh, for Jesus Amaya, position A. And then Sylvia Sanchez Garza for position B. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Dr. Rodriguez for position A. I'll for, second. Uh, Jesus Amaya. And for position B, uh, Ms. Sanchez Garza. Okay, we have a second by Mr. Los Santos. Do we have any discussion? <coughs> okay, let's take it to a vote. Signify your approval by saying, I want to call your name. Mr. Stata? Aye. Mr. Trevino? Aye. Dr. Heyman? Aye. And Mr. Los Santos? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Part B, discussion and possible action to designate a delegate and alternate representative to serve on the 2021 TASB Delegate Assembly. Do we have any volunteers? <laughs> <laughs> this is an assembly that is uh that convenes annually in conjunction with the TASA TASB con convention. Anybody going? Anybody attending? I will not attend. I, I, so. I won't be there. I think I did sign up. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Jackie, would I did. I did sign up for this convention. For this convention. Okay. Would you like to represent our uh, uh, school as a? Delegate? I think I'm going to be the only one there. Nobody else is going. Who else is going? Uh, I'm did, going. I, also, I'll Jackie. make a motion. Designate uh, Trustee Jackie, Jackie okay. Sustaita. 
We have a Is motion there? by Mr. Los Santos and a second by our delegate. I'll second that. A second by Mr. by Dr. Rodriguez for Jackie Susaita to represent us as a delegate. And uh, you have an alternate. Uh, Costa Rivinia, would you like to be the alternate? Yes. Okay. I sure will. We have volunteer uh, for Costa Rivinia to be a uh, the alternate. Do we have a motion? A motion. We have a motion by Dr. Rodriguez and a second by Mr. Los Santos to have uh, uh, Costa Rivinia be the uh, alternate. So, uh, take it to a vote. Signify your approval by saying I when I call your name. Ms. Saito? Aye. Costa Rivinia? Aye. Dr. Rodriguez? Aye. And Mr. Los Santos? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Part C, discussion of possible action for the board to consider approval of electrical repairs for the Beatriz Garza Middle School 200 wing. Dr. Bundes. Mr. President, um, this, the, we recommend that the Board of Trustees approve the electrical repairs needed for Beatriz Garza Middle School 200 wing. I will call on Mr. Sanchez and Mr. Americo Garza, our internal engineer. You may proceed, gentlemen. Good evening, uh, Good evening. Dr. Valdez, uh, Coach Cuer, members of the board. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, right around that time, we experienced uh, problems with the 200 wing at Bigarza Middle School. Um, we uh, did our troubleshooting in-house. Our electricians uh, detected a short in the primary lines coming into that wing from the main switch gear, which is over a chiller plant. Um, so having said that, we've already experienced this last year. And so we called uh, one of our, uh, uh, the vendors that, not our vendor, but uh, vendors that uh, has done service for us, uh, service uh, electrical company that has done electrical service for us. And they came out here, they confirmed the problem, and we asked them for a proposal to, uh, to repair that. Now, the, the repairs consist of rerunning new line. And what we did last year uh, was we had to run conduit and new line above the ceiling grid from, again, the main switch gear to the, to the wing, to the electrical room in that, for that wing. Um, and so they proposed the same thing. I said, well, there's, there's really no other way. Otherwise, we're looking at if the short is underneath concrete, then the, the, the work is going to be major. Uh, there is the atrium in the middle of the campus. There's a tree in there. And we suspect that last year we had that problem caused by the tree that was uh, the, almost uprooted by some storms that we had uh, come through that, uh, the, at that time. And so that's going to be major work, so we decided to reroute the line at the time. Uh, we called another company uh, also to come in and, and look at it and see what the cost would be for them. Uh, it is high, and that's why we're here uh, asking for your approval uh, for, for c Electric Electric to, to get that work done. They are the, the low cost, the low bid. One thing that we left out, with all due respect, uh, by, uh, Citro Electric is a buyboard company, right. so we didn't have to offer proposals because of that. But we have used it before using the contract from buyboard, okay. and that's the company we're recommending, and they're the lower price. Thank you. Do we have a motion on the? Uh... I'll make a motion. I'll second. Okay. We have a motion by Dr. Rodriguez and a second by Mr. Los Santos. For the board to approve or consider the approval of the electric repairs for the Atlantic Garza Middle School 220. <coughs> Any discussion? Okay, take it to a vote. Signify your approval by saying I want to call your name. Is it Stato? Aye. Costa Vino? Aye. Dr. Rodriguez? Aye. Mr. Mascona Santos? Aye. Motion carries. Item D. Discussing a possible action for the board to consider approval to purchase portable air cleaning units for offices in small areas, RFP number 21-07-34, Dr. Valdez. Mr. President, this is um, due to the continued concerns, right, with uh, and getting schools ready for uh, back to school and, uh, and regarding student safety, staff safety, um, we do need to consider the approval of, to purchase portable air cleaning units for offices in small areas. So we're bringing this f to you for approval. And uh, I, gentlemen, you may proceed, Mr. Sanchez and Mr. Garza.
Yes, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Valdez. We uh, we have requested uh, we did a request for proposals for these uh, air training units for the small small area, the offices, small spaces, and we had uh, 21 proposals received. Of those, we, we asked uh, the vendor to provide uh, samples. Of the vendors that we we had 12 vendors that submitted proposals, only nine provided uh, sample units. After we reviewed them, uh, the the proposal that we received with the samples. The committee that evaluated determined that four cleaning units, only four, met uh, specified requirements. A lot of that had to do with the HEPA filter, and uh, we recommend we we evaluated those companies, and they're listed in the table below. The uh, Kerry Enterprises, School Specialty, Environmentally Quality Service, and Texas Health Products. The the unit that we looked at are listed on the columns, the third column to the sixth column. The first two were the smallest item. Is the brand Metafy Air MA15. The next one is the Metafy Air MA25. And the third one, the large uh, unit that we considered, is a carrier model called Smart Air RMAP SST. The prices are listed, and carrier enterprises provided the lowest price on all three items. So we recommended that we buy them from them, that they are waterproof to buy them from them. And we'd like to, for the board to approve that we buy all three units. We do not know exactly yet how many units of each we're going to need, because we need to go to the, the units, the, uh, the spaces, to see whether we put in the smallest one, the middle one, or the large one of those units. They, they all work pretty good. We tested them. The committee tested them. We met at the business office, and we tried them on, and they, they work pretty good. And uh, the prices are very good. Uh, delivery is five to 10 days after they receive the purchase order. So. Uh, we like to recommend uh, the waterproof that we buy those three. So, so if I may, uh, we do have the samples that they provided out here to my right. And so we've got the smallest one being that model 15, and then the slightly larger tabletop units, uh, that's a model 25. And then of course the other one that's the, down to, to the side of that, that's on the floor, that's the larger unit. So we have a, a, a variety of sizes of offices in the campuses. We have. Uh, also the reception areas and the main administration areas of the campuses. So we'd like to possibly use the larger one in those areas so that we avoid having to put multiple of the tabletop units and try to capture the, the, the space or serve the space with one of the larger units. Again, as Mr. Sanchez mentioned, we've got an estimated total of about 475 just for schools alone, not, uh, not adding or including all the department uh, or administrative uh, buildings. Uh, Stephen F. Austin being one, this campus being another one, uh, and also the support buildings uh, uh, for activities such as the, aquari uh, the aquatic center, the, uh, the pack, and so forth. So again, we're recommending that we approve all those three units, and that way we can actually have the flexibility of installing you know, the, the unit specified for the space. Yeah, uh, the estimated cost is between $60,000 and $85,000. Make a motion to approve. I'll second. Okay, who is the motion? To Mr. Los Santos. Mm -hmm. Motions. Uh, made a motion to approve and a second by Dr. Rodriguez. Any discussion? Okay, take it to a vote. Signify your approval, say aye when I call your name. Mrs. Sustaita? Aye. Mr. Trevino? Aye. Dr. Rodriguez? Aye. And Mr. Los Santos? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Item E, discussion and possible action for the board to consider approval of fourth and fifth invoices from Weaver and Tedwell LLP for work done in June and July 2021 on the forensic audit of the district. Dr. Valdez. So it is um, time to move forward in um, approving the fourth and fifth with your approval, obviously, fourth and fifth invoices. Uh, from the CPA firm of Weaver and Tidwell, LLP, um, to conduct the forensic audit uh, for the district's finances and operations. So we're coming before you for approval. Make a motion to approve. I have a motion by Mr. Los Santos. I'll second. A second by Mr. Staita to approve the uh, fourth and fifth invoices from Weaver and Tidwell. Uh, any discussion? 
Uh, do we have a preliminary date, uh, as in when will we be done? The final. Council? Okay, uh, Andres? Yes, I was told that they might be done by the end of the month. By the end of this yep. month? Yes, yeah, August. So they will be presented this time in September. Yes, so we would only have one more invoice pending, or that's it? August. Or maybe a little, couple of days in September okay. for the presentation. Coach Mondo, I spoke to Travis this morning. He said by August 29th. He said if you wanted to place him on the agenda any time in the upcoming weeks, he'll be available to the board. Reject? Yes. Okay. Any, any further discussion? No, I just think it's important. I know that I had some calls and concerns from the community. They wanted to know what the status was. And I know there's been a discussion about the timeline, the cost, et cetera. Um, but this is a company that was brought in to, to do a unbiased uh, evaluation of our district in, in multiple areas. And I think it's, and it is effective. A lot of districts throughout Texas do this on a routine basis at five to six year intervals. Uh, we're talking about millions of dollars of, of taxpayer dollars that are, that are uh, going directly to students. And, and it's a good way to evaluate this, the, the district as well. Um, like I said, it's non-political and un, it's unbiased. In the beginning, uh, Weaver did inform us that a, audit would, a forensic audit with minimal findings would take anywhere from four to six weeks. And as you can see, here we are today still in August, and, and hopefully this will be the final month. And, and once, those, uh, once that report is ready, of course, we've already voted that we'd share that with the public and, and review it uh, all together. And, um, and I just wanted to state that, that we do have a yearly audit as well that's done. Um, and there, were, there was questions from the community saying, well, we already have a yearly audit. And there was people out there saying, well, we already do a yearly audit. But these are two completely different types of audits. The, the audit that's done yearly is required by the state. And that's where you see the rankings, like the first rating that the business office gets and some of the others. That's something that you have to pay and, re and get every single year. But it's, it is on a whole completely le different level compared to a forensic audit. If you, and, and that's something that the individual that did our audit last year stated in his presentation of his yearly audit. Uh, for the district saying that if you look at the level and the depth of, of, of what takes place, it's completely different. You know, Weaver's uh, uh, preliminary findings, you know, they discussed going over, you know, millions of emails. They went over five years of, of funding. It's almost a billion dollars. And so the report itself is a great investment for taxpayers because you get to see and evaluate for yourselves how the organization is performing. And, and whether all the protocols and controls are in place and whatnot, and, and like I said, and it's a, it'll be a clear uh, representation of where we stand. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there because there have been a lot of questions. Uh, it's been in the media lately, and so that's just something I wanted to clarify for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hotels. Okay, we have a motion and a second. No more discussion. Let's take it to a vote. Signify your approval. Say nine. When I call your name, Mrs. Faito. Aye. Costa Lumino. Aye. Dr. Rodriguez? Aye. And Mr. Los Santos? Aye. Okay, motion carries. That takes us to item 11. Closed meeting to discuss. A, personnel matters, Texas Government Code 551.074. 1, employment of personnel, certified professional, and non-contractual personnel. 2, resignations. 3, deliberation regarding the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, Discipline or dismissal of a public officer or employee, Texas Government Code 551.074 and 551.071. A, superintendent's recommendation for the position of athletic director. B, deliberation regarding acquisition of real property, Texas Government Code 551.072. And C, consultation with attorney regarding A, pending or contemplated litigation. B, a settlement offer. Or C, a matter in which the duty of the attorney to the Westico ISD under the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct of the State Bar of Texas clearly conflicts with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, Texas Government Code 551.071. The time now is 7.54, and we will go into closed session. The time now is 9.05, and we have reconvened an open meeting. 
A. Possible action if necessary on items discussed in closed meeting. One, discussing a possible action on new employment, certified professional and non-contractual personnel. Dr. Valdez. Mr. President, we recommend, uh, I recommend approval for, um, for uh, certified professional and non-contractual personnel as discussed in closed session. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Los Santos. Yes. Yes, sir. And uh, a second by Mrs. Saita. Any discussion? No. Okay. Let's take it to a vote. Certify, uh, signify your approval by saying I'm going to call your name. Ms. Saita? Aye. Mr. Lavinio? Aye. Dr. Rodriguez? Aye. And Mr. Los Santos? Aye. Motion carries. Number two, discussion and possible action on resignations. Dr. Valdez. Recommendation is for approval as discussed in closed session. Motion to approve. I have a motion by Mr. Los Santos and a second by okay. Mr. Taita. Any discussion? No. Take it to a vote. Signify your approval by saying I'm going to call your name. Mr. Taita. Aye. Pastor Aye. Dr. Rodriguez. Aye. And Mr. Los Santos. Aye. Three, discussion of possible action on superintendent's recommendation for the position of athletic director. Dr. Valdez. Recommendation for athletic director is Mr. Desi Rodriguez. Motion to approve. We have a Again. motion by Mr. Los Santos. Second by Mr. Sustaita. Any discussion? Okay, let's take it to a vote. Signify your approval by saying I want to call your name. Mr. Sustaita? Aye. Costa Aye. Mr. Los Santos? Aye. Motion carries. Discussing a possible accident on acquisition of real property, Texas Government Code 55.072. Uh, no action item? No action item, Mr. President. Okay, no action. We will now go to item 13. Closed meeting to hear a level three grievance requested by M. Segura pursuant to Westlaco ISD policy, DGBA local. Okay, we're going to ask everyone to leave that has nothing to do with the grievance. Uh -huh. Okay, the uh, time now is uh, 1028 p.m. and the board has reconvened an open session with regard to the level three grievance requested by Melva Segura. Pursuant to what's the quality policy, DGBA local. Does any board member have a motion? I make a motion to deny. The motion by Mr. De Los Santos. I second. And a second by Cochesi Trevino. Is there any discussion? No? Let's take it to a vote. Signify your approval by saying aye or no if you disapprove. Mrs. Jackie Sustaita? Aye. Coach Jesse Trevino? Aye. Dr. Jaime Rodriguez? Aye. Mr. Mark de los Santos? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. German? Adjourn. Item 15, adjournment. So move. The time now is 1029.